there's a whole host of receptors and uh, several uh, chemicals in our environment are promiscuous and will bind to these receptors and cause the cell to change how it processes energy. And in the process, you lay down fat. So this is a real thing. And the point of the paper was to not just demonstrate that these um, mechanisms are associated with obesity, but actually that they are causative. So, you know, we can't ignore this problem anymore. Friends, welcome to a whole new level. This is Dr. Casey Means, co-founder and chief medical officer of Levels. And I am so excited about this episode because it's a topic that we do not talk about enough, which is the role of environmental toxins and how they affect our metabolism and our propensity to gain weight. I often talk about the eight pillars that contribute to metabolic health, which include food, sleep, exercise, stress management, micronutrients, microbiome, exposure to sunlight, and exposure to environmental toxins. And I think that last one honestly gets the least airtime, but today we're devoting the entire episode to this and we're talking with Dr. Rob Lustig um, about this topic and specifically about obesogens, which are these invisible small molecules that exist all throughout our environment um, that are minimally regulated and that actually um, through several mechanisms that we talk about today impact our core metabolic physiology. So these are chemicals that are put into our food, our water, they're in our air, our soil, our home care products, they're in our personal care products, they're in our mattresses, um, they're on our furniture, they're in the containers that we store our food in, they're really everywhere. Um, and Rob has published, along with 44 other authors, um, a series of papers that are coming out today that are landmark papers looking at um, the mechanisms of obesity, but also one of the three papers specifically talks about obesogens, which are these compounds um, in our environment that are now mechanistically shown to directly cause obesity and may actually contribute to about 15% of what actually leads to obesity because obviously it's a multifactorial issue, um, but this is a key one that we're now showing actually is not correlation, but causatively related to obesity. Um, since 74% of American adults are dealing with overweight or obesity, this is a topic that is relevant to uh, really um, almost everyone. Um, and what's really important to tune into is that these toxins actually also affect the genetics of our eggs and our sperm. So our, our sex cells, um, and so can have impacts on, on, on the next generation and on our offspring. Um, so something we really need to be aware of. So we are so fortunate today to be joined by Dr. Rob Lustig, uh, to talk about the details of these, uh, of this incredible paper that he's putting out today. We're going to be talking about one of the three papers that are coming out in a group today, um, and that is the, the, the one on obesogens, um, these environmental toxins. Um, as you know, Rob is a Levels advisor. He's the author of Fat Chance, Metabolical, Hacking of the American Mind, three of my favorite books in the entire world. Um, he's a professor emeritus uh, at UCSF. He's a regular on a whole new level, and he is one of my um, absolute personal heroes and guides. So we are so thrilled to have him today and we will jump right in. Rob, welcome to a whole new level. We're so excited to have you back. It's always my pleasure, Casey. I'd rather spend time with you than anybody else. <laughs> well, thank you. I agree. And I am so excited about this topic we're discussing today. Um, it's so important because it is so under-recognized. So jumping right in, um, what what this incredible landmark paper that is coming out today is telling people is that one of the elements of metabolic dysfunction and weight gain that we don't think about or talk about a lot is environmental toxins and how they affect our physiology at the at the deepest level. 
And, you know, if, if diet and exercise weren't enough for us to get on top of, now we're realizing that actually chemicals in our food, our water, our air, our personal care products, our home products actually may be directly contributing to weight gain and obesity. Um, and I think this might be fairly shocking to people who already feel like we're, you know, um, up against a lot in terms of being healthy in the U S and now there's all these little invisible chemicals that we need to worry about. And it's, it's, it's kind of scary. And so I think my first question for you is, um, why do you think that this topic has flown so under the radar so far that, that these chemicals that are everywhere are actually directly promoting weight gain? Well, ask the same question about why all these chemicals out there are causing cancer and why that flew under the radar for so long. The fact is you can't see them. You can't determine what's got them and what doesn't. You can't determine whether there's cause and effect unless you do large studies, which are hard to do to start with and you know um, hard to fund. Uh, the fact of the matter is... Um, we had a belief system that said that obesity is due to, you know, too much going in and too little going out. Uh, you know, it's all about calories. And if you believe that the problem is calories, then why in the world would you be looking for chemicals that, you know, specifically cause weight gain? After all, those chemicals don't necessarily have any calories. So, you know, there are a lot of reasons that, you know, people have ignored this field, but the, the toxicologists have known about it uh, and have, you know, been studying this now for about, I would say, 15 years. And I've been aware of it since 2007. And um, the NIH uh, has specifically funded research in this field to try to bring it to fruition to determine whether or not this is a real cause of obesity that we have to be concerned about, or whether this is just another, you know, thing along for the ride or, you know, just a, a diversion. And the this paper that's coming out now, um, which has 44 authors, all basic scientists and clinicians in biochemical pharmacology, a real journal, um, you know, 48 pages long, uh, basically, you know, puts, you know, the, the marker, you know, down, you know, it's, it's, it's the uh, line in the sand and says, this is a real thing. And it is not just correlative, it is causative for obesity. Now, it is not the whole enchilada. It's not like everything is an obesogen. I mean, diet still plays a major role. Exercise still plays a supportive role, you know, not, not a major role, but a supportive role. But these obesogens probably account for a good 15 to 20% of the obesity problem. And you know, the sad part is most of these obesogens are forever chemicals and they're not going away anytime. So let's define some terms here. Um, so first of all, the paper talks a lot about this term endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs, and then of course the term obesogen. These might be new to people. So can you talk about what these mean? Um, also maybe mention what you mean by forever chemicals and, and sort of where are they found in our environment? So first of all, what's an obesogen? An obesogen is a chemical <clears throat> that specifically drives fat cell accumulation. And that fat cell can accumulation can occur in subcutaneous fat, as in, does this swimsuit make me look fat? or it can uh, drive visceral fat, <clears throat> as in, you know, my belly is fat, or it can drive liver fat or muscle fat, um, and not necessarily even show, but it will cause chronic metabolic disease. <clears throat> so obesogens are chemicals that bind to receptors. Receptors are proteins in cells that take information from the outside and alter what happens to the cell on the inside. And in the process, those cells then take up extra energy and lay it down as fat. Now, some of the obesogens are caloric. 
like, for instance, fructose, are my favorite compound. But most of the obesogens are things that are found in everyday items within the home, outside the home, and in particular, things like agricultural products. So let me give you some places where you might not think about obesogens being. How about um, uh, vinyl flooring? How about uh, 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 flame retardants? How about uh, uh, electronics? How about pesticides? How about disinfectants? How about um, thermal paper and resins? Uh, how about personal care products like lipsticks? How about drugs, you know, like prescription drugs? All of these have the capacity to bind to receptors in the body, and there are several receptors that are involved. The important ones are the insulin receptor, the glucocorticoid receptor, a receptor called PPAR gamma, peroxisome proliferation activated receptor gamma. Um, there's a, uh, a aryl hydrocarbon receptor. There's the Farnesoid X receptor. There's the uh, androstane receptor. There's a whole host of receptors. And uh, several uh, chemicals in our environment are promiscuous and will bind to these receptors and cause the cell to change how it processes energy. And in the process, you lay down fat. So this is a real thing. And the point of the paper was to not just demonstrate that these um, mechanisms are associated with obesity, but actually that they are causative. So, you know, we can't ignore this problem anymore. Interesting. So just drilling in on something you just said there, in terms of what these molecules are doing, they are in some way changing the way that the body is able to make energy. So this fundamental core pathway of metabolism. And when that gets perturbed and we're not producing energy properly in the body, it causes us to lay down more fat. So that sounds like a key concept people need to kind of understand is that anything that disrupts our energy producing pathways of the body can in turn lead us to essentially accumulating more, more fat. Absolutely. And there are several different mechanisms that are involved. Um, there's uh, epigenetics, you know, DNA methylation, uh, there's histone modifications, there's uh, RNA methylation, there's um, uh, chromatin remodeling, there's microRNAs, and then of course there's, you know, direct receptor effects uh, 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 of their own. And, you know, these, uh, you know, these, these mechanisms uh, can be occurring actually before birth. They can be occurring in the, in the womb, in utero, these things can be going on. We have the data to show that women who are exposed to these compounds end up having offspring that, you know, are both more obese and have metabolic syndrome later. And we have found that um, feed, you know, fetal and early childhood is actually uh, the most vulnerable time so this is a time when, you, you know, the, the, you, you can't blame, you know, the, the patient, you know, the, you know, you cannot blame the four month old. And the problem is that, you know, four month olds are exposed to lots of these, like, for instance, uh, babe, uh, baby bottle nipples um, have BPA as an example, uh, or phthalates. These are uh, compounds that are plasticizers that are, you know, uh, pretty ubiquitous throughout. If you ever open a can uh, of uh, food and you see a white uh, lining on the inside, that's BPA. So it's in all of our food. And BPA is one of the primary drivers of this problem. It's also when you get a, uh, a, a thermal receipt from the, you know, from Target or from any other store, there's BPA in that, um, in that thermal paper. 
So we're all exposed to this stuff all the time. And it is having effects on all aspects of energy metabolism within the cells at the molecular level. And it's causing, like I said, changes in epigenetics. It's change, you know, changing not the DNA coding, but the G DNA expression. And it is you know, binding to these protein receptors to drive um, fat cell accumulation, also to drive mitochondrial dysfunction, to, you know, to cause mitochondria to not function as well, thereby reducing the rate of energy burning. You know, it's been shown now that body temperature has gone down like a half a degree across the board over the last 25 years. You cannot explain that on the basis of diet. Why is body temperature lower today than it was 25 years ago? Well, it's because our mitochondria aren't burning energy and giving off heat at the same rate. So what's causing that? Well, it's very likely these obesogens that are affecting mitochondrial function. That is so interesting about the temperature going down and just thinking about our bodies as these poorly working furnaces that are not generating heat appropriately. And when we think about the fact that, you know, we've got these 37 trillion or so cells in our body and every single one needs cellular energy to function and that you know, we're, we're surrounded by these invisible chemicals that are essentially making that harder to do. It's, uh, it's, it's ominous. Um, so several follow-up questions for you there. I think the first is, is getting into mechanism and you alluded to this a little bit. You talked about some of the mechanisms. So this paper to give people an overview, definitely recommend reading the whole thing. It actually is really I think it's a read that almost, it's got a lot of technical terms in it, but it's very, very well articulated, um, I think, for anyone. And But you go through dozens of different chemicals um, that are found in our environment that can lead to that can lead to problems in our obesogens. Um, and you talk about several mechanisms of how they're actually doing their harm. Um, you just mentioned um, epigenetics. You talked about direct receptor top, uh, targets. You talked about mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, can you can you kind of go through each mechanism briefly? That you mentioned four main ones in the paper, just to give people a sense. You know, take us into the level of the cell. Like the cell is maybe a thing that some people listening haven't thought about a lot. But um, you know, what are the different areas that these chemical compounds are acting on? And then you know, the downstream effect being that it's essentially screwing up our fundamental energy production. But this is happening from all different directions. Um, so maybe just speak to some of some of those that, that people should be aware of. Okay. So the first thing uh, the audience should know is that there actually is not one paper. <clears throat> there are three and they're uh, being published uh, as a group in biochemical pharmacology. Uh, and <clears throat> the first one, which I am the first author on, is an overview and also the uh, molecular and biochemical mechanisms by which obesity occurs in cells. The second is the one that we're talking about that actually lists the obesogens and how they work and demonstrating that they are causative of obesity, not just associated. And then the third paper is a little bit more technical. It's on um, obesity assays. How do you determine whether or not a chemical is an obesogen? What criteria does it have to meet? That's its own paper. So you can, and each paper stands alone. <clears throat> so the two papers, the obesity one and obesity two, that we're really talking about today, you have to understand that cells take in information and they take in the information through uh, uh, proteins that are on the surface of the cell or inside the cell. And these proteins are called receptors. And the receptors are for hormones and there are receptors for chemicals. And some chemicals mimic hormones and some chemicals just bind straight to the chemical receptor. Now, those receptors can ultimately have effects on uh, uh, adipose tissue differentiation they can take stem cells and turn them into adipocytes. 
fat so cells. basically you increase the number of fat cells. This is particularly problematic in utero and in the baby. So babies who are exposed to these chemicals will end up being more obese because they have more fat cells. And it's often been said that your number of fat cells are determined by the time you are two years old. And that's likely true. And we have some data based on um, uh, atomic bomb testing that has shown us that, in fact, the adipose tissue uh, number doesn't change that much after age two. But the adipose tissue has to be growing before that age two. And so these receptors are very, very attuned. And if you're exposed to these chemicals, and I know this because uh, I took care of these children uh, in uh, Salinas, which is in the middle of the, um, uh, you know, California Central Valley, where, you know, lots and lots of um, crops are grown. You know, it's an agricultural community, mostly uh, immigrant from Mexico. Uh, and we were do we've done a study along with UC Berkeley called the Chamacos study, where we measured these chemicals in the urine of pregnant women about 25 years ago, and have watched what happened to the offspring in terms of um, cognition, in terms of puberty, in terms of obesity uh, ever since. And what we've shown is that the amount of uh, chemicals in the urine of pregnant women specifically predicted what would happen to uh, the child uh, afterward in terms of uh, puberty and obesity. So these are, you know, we now have these data to show that, you know, we're basically poisoning our fetuses, uh, you know, and the people who are at, you know, most vulnerable are the people who are exposed to these at the earliest time points. So that's one, one issue. A uh, second issue is that, as you know, women are different from men. Women have curves. Well, those curves are subcutaneous fat. And those curves are determined by estrogen binding to the estrogen receptor. Well, it turns out that the estrogen receptor is the most promiscuous molecule on the planet. All you have to be to be an estrogen is uh, have two hydroxyl groups, 22 angstroms apart, and you're an estrogen. Now, we've known for decades now that women who were given DES, diethylstilbestrol, when they were pregnant back in the 1950s, ended up with um, babies with significant birth defects. And so DES has since been banned. And that's good. But turns out that low levels of DES didn't cause birth defects, it caused obesity. And we've now learned that DDT, which was the first pesticide that was used commercially, starting back in the 1940s, is an obesogen and cause not just birth defects, but significant obesity. This is, of course, the book that Rachel Carson wrote, you know, called Silent Spring back in 1962, which started the environmental movement. Well, guess what? DDT is not around anymore, but its metabolite, DDE, is, and DDE is an obesogen. And it still can be measured in pregnant women urine. So this stuff, you know, it stopped being produced in 1972, but we could measure it in the urine of pregnant women in 1999. So 27 years later, this stuff's still around and the amount of this stuff predicted the obesity in the offspring of those women. So this is extraordinarily worrisome. Because, you know, if it's still around and it's not going away, what are we going to do? Well, you know, PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid, also known as Teflon. Remember Teflon? You don't see any uh, um, frying pans made with Teflon anymore. 
you ever see the movie Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo came out in 2019, it's all about the Teflon scandal and what DuPont did to hide the information. The fact of the matter is PFOAs are still around, PFAS as they're called, per uh, 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 fluorooctanoic uh, 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 substances. So um, these things are causing uh, obesity, uh, you know, even though they've since been taken off the market. And, um, uh, you know, aside from, you know, those obvious ones, uh, phthalates, like I talked about plasticizers, PBDEs um, uh, uh, are uh, flame retardants that are in mattresses and in baby um, uh, clothing. These are all things that are still around and are uh, potentially uh, in any given baby causing uh, harm by laying down more fat and causing uh, 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 you know, metabolic syndrome later on in the, in the baby. So this is particularly worrisome and, um, and it, it, it's not going away. One thing I found striking about this paper, obesity too, some of the other mechanisms that were mentioned, um, you know, you just talked about some of the the effects of these small molecules directly on receptors on the cell membrane. So acting almost like an estrogen to bind to these receptors we already have and having these downstream cascades and then the effect on epigenetics. So actually how our genome is expressed, how it's folded um, and how that can affect us in our current life, but also can affect the next generation because epigenetic changes can be heritable. Um, and some of the other mechanisms that were mentioned were things like how these chemicals actually impact inflammation in the body, how they impact oxidative stress. You mentioned mitochondrial dysfunction, um, microbiome. And what, what struck me reading through this was that a lot of these were the exact same mechanisms that you talked about in chapter seven of your book, Metabolical, which is my favorite chapter, I think, of any book ever written, but it's basically <laughs> like the overview of systems biology and why this idea that all the diseases we talk about and the 42 medical specialties, everything being so separate, actually, there are just a small set of core physiologic disturbances that lead to almost all disease. And some of these in the book that you talk about are oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, insulin resistance. It's all the same stuff that we're talking about in terms of how obesogens disturb the body to create obesity. And so that leads me to kind of two, two questions. Um, one is like, it seems like this is a far bigger problem than just obesity. I mean, obesity is a big problem, but this is not, I mean, it's almost like the word obesogen limits too much, uh, like the, the magnitude of what's happening here, because if it's affecting all of these different pathways, our core hormonal pathways, our core energy producing pathways and our core mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, oxidative stress, et cetera, um, then this could affect all aspects of health. So do you, do you get the sense that this is actually, these chemicals are not just about making us fat, but actually making us sick in all sorts of other ways? Well, so that, what you're describing, Casey, is the, uh, the fact that there is this uh, larger grouping called EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and then within that, there is a subset of endocrine disrupting chemicals called obesogens. So endocrine disrupting chemicals by, you know, basically do what you just said, which is bind to any receptor, uh, you know, cause any epigenetic problem leading to some aspect of cellular uh, metabolic change that can lead ultimately to disease. And that can be reproductive, that can be cognitive, that can be cardiovascular or endocrine or uh, cancer. These are all endocrine disrupting chemicals, and there are many, many different types, and there are many different ways they work. This set of papers is just talking about the subset called obesogens. So all of the ones we're talking about are specifically related to weight gain in some fashion. But if you want to take the whole EDC field, we know about EDCs because 
we have cancer. And we've been sh we've shown, you know, 50 ways from Sunday that EDCs are important in the development of cancer. So that's already on the map. The reason this set of papers are important is because the concept of obesogens has been deep sixed by a lot of um, scientists as being sort of, uh, you know, sort of not relevant or not the big issue or, you know, it's still about calories. The fact that we've shown in these papers that obesogens are causative, causative, not just correlative, not just the result of a problem, but the cause of a problem is the, you know, you know, big reason why, you know, I'm happy to talk to you about this now. And the big reason why everybody should look at these papers. You know, the, the other thing I, you know, I want to make a clear to the audience is that People are, you know, focused on food. Hey, I'm focused on food. Um, you know, I wrote <laughs> several books about food. Uh, I'm focused on food. The fact of the matter is, you know, food is more than just its calories. There are a lot of things in food that shouldn't really be in food. You know, I mean, there have been a lot of food additives that this, the, the food industry specifically adds to stuff like emulsifiers, which can cause inflammation in the intestine, which can lead to leaky gut and therefore metabolic syndrome. And that, you know, and that inflammation can ultimately lead to insulin resistance and the insulin resistance can lead to obesity. But how you grow the food. So one of the compounds that we spend a lot of time talking about in this paper is a compound that everyone's now heard of called glyphosate or Roundup. Okay. Who hasn't heard of Roundup? All right. First made by Monsanto and then Monsanto was uh, bought by Bayer, uh, you know, in, in Germany. And, you know, it's been, glyphosate's been associated with cancer, with lymphoma in particular, but the fact is glyphosate has also now been shown to be causative of obesity, you know, and glyphosate is in almost every food. So, you know, the calories cannot easily be dissociated from the glyphosate that is part of the calories because glyphosate is an amino acid. So, you know, things get very complicated and very hairy in terms of trying to explain all of this. So can you get GMO free? Can you get glyphosate free? Can you get herbicide free uh, food? And the answer is yes, you can, but boy, oh boy, is it expensive and it's kind of hard. And there are parts of the country that can't get it. So you know, this is a perennial problem. This is a problem that's not going away. And this is a problem that the food industry continues to um, uh, promulgate and, um, you know, just then hiding behind the concept of calories. So that, that brings me to the question of really like, what is driving this problem? Like, is it, first of all, um, are most of these, I noticed that some of the, some of the obesogens are naturally occurring. Like I think cadmium was one of them and arsenic. And then some of them are obviously synthetic, like glyphosate and like, you know, phthalates and things like that. Like these are industrially manufactured. So can you talk a little bit about like how these split between naturally occurring things and um, synthetically um, created things? And um, I guess who's the bad guy here? <laughs> Yeah, well, a uh, couple of bad guys, but um, yes, you're absolutely right. Most of most of the obesogens are uh, synthetic chemicals. Okay, only a couple are naturally occurring. Uh, you're right. Cadmium is one. Arsenic's another. Arsenic is you know found in certain water supplies. Uh, cadmium is mostly, I mean, it, it's found in other products, but the main product that has cadmium is cocoa. And in particular, cocoa from South America. Don't know why, uh, but that's where there's a high cadmium burden. Um, so, you know, and, and general, uh, you know, shall we say cheap cocoa uh, tends to come from South America. Uh, 
there, there I mean, there's cocoa plantations all over the, the world, but that's the that's the primary uh, uh, place where where you find cadmium. Most of the other uh, uh, compounds are uh, synthetic in some fashion. Uh, you know, they they may have started out as natural products and then be you know then then been modified to be synthetic. A lot of them, as I said, are pesticides like DDT, DDE, like uh, glyphosate. Uh, so they're very specifically sprayed on fo uh, food to keep the pests from getting into them. Neonicotinoid pesticides, permethrin, for instance, uh, is another example uh, of, of, of that kind of, uh, 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 of obesogen. Uh, hey, uh, 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 air pollution. Air pollution, uh, particulate matter, causes inflammation, and inflammation causes insulin resistance, and insulin resistance leads to obesity as well. So diesel exhaust. Now, who would have thought diesel exhaust would have been an obesogen? But it is. The fact is, the closer you live to a freeway, the more um, weight you gain. And people thought, well, that's because people who live close to free, freeways are lower socioeconomic status uh, people uh, because they, you know, because that's where they build, you know, housing projects, et cetera. And while that's true, that's all been factored in. And it has now been shown not just to be associated, but actually causative. We have the mechanisms by which causation you know, occurs. So we have now, instead of just correlative data, we have causative data. And there are two kinds of causative data. There's um, experimental causation, you know, where you do interventional data. Um, you don't do that in humans, you do that in animals. But that we also have um, what's known as econometric data, where you can look at natural history studies, and you can show that the change in weight or in the change in uh, obesity rates uh, are predicted by these changes and they're not explained by anything else and that they predate the, uh, uh, the change in obesity. So that's called econometric analysis. And we now have that data. And, that, and that's the point of the paper is explaining what level of data we have to show this. And you know, we also show what aspect of uh, the the um, fat cell process is uh, being affected, whether it's the differentiation of stem cells into adipocytes, whether it's the laying down of fat in the liver, whether it's the dyslipidemia in the bloodstream, whether it's the fatty liver itself, whether it's a neurological problem or a food, uh, an energy problem or a mitochondrial problem or a microbiome problem in the intestine. Um, we now have the pathways for each of these uh, chemicals, and we, you know, uh, discuss the gradation of the um, uh, the veracity of the data, the quality of the data, to demonstrate when we know ca causation and when we don't. And boy, oh boy, do we know causation! Is there a world in which? our computing capabilities get good enough and our mechanisms, our understanding is strong enough that we could screen, you know, for chemicals that are being created in the industrial industry and sort of know what's going to be a problem and what's not sort of ahead of time and or retroactively do this such that we can start, you know, eliminating some of these things. What's, what's the path forward from the industry perspective? Absolutely. And that's the reason for the third paper is the obesity assays, you know, the fact is that virtually all of these compounds have been put into our environment without any meaningful regulation or, you know, or, uh, you know, assessment by the FDA or the EPA or the USDA. All right. They it's mind blowing. Are released into the environment. They're quote safe. Who says they're safe? You know, and, how do you find out if they're safe? You know, we thought dioxin was safe for decades uh, and only found out about the cancer that dioxin caused 
you know, 40 years after they started appearing, they started, you know, being manufactured in 1902. And it wasn't until a uh, factory in Seviso, Italy blew up in in the 1960s that we really learned about what dioxins were really doing. So, you know, how does this stuff get into our uh, environment? How does it get into our food supply? How does it get into our water supply in the first place? The answer is no one's looking. That's the real reason. Well, the reason for these papers are important is because we now give the government, and it has to be the government because who else is going to do it? The, the, the industry is not going to do it. They're the ones perpetrating the crime. Okay, somebody's got to be watching out. Well, we give the in the government the tools to be able to actually determine whether or not any given compound is an obesogen. And so it ultimately is incumbent upon them to use this information to determine what should be allowed and what should not. And thus far, uh, the government's been asleep at the switch. What's so perplexing to me is that like, if you like Google molecules, which sometimes I'll do for fun, I'll do like, what's the structure of this thing? You know? And it's like, you look at drugs, all of these are just like these small molecules. A lot of them are like little molecules, hydrocarbons, you know, a few other. And it's like, we basically are allowing with these industrial chemicals, it's, it's sort of like, how do we, how is it different than drugs in a way? Like we're basically, these chemicals are acting on us like pharmaceuticals are yet are totally unregulated. And it's like, what is that distinction between, you know, a a company comes up with a food additive or comes up with some sort of flame retardant and puts it in everything versus developing a drug and then marketing that and then having that go through FDA approval. It it feels like there's a really strange disconnect between basically just what people call these things, but they are essentially drugs, right? Like, Of course, (laughs) that's exactly right. There are compounds that are selective poisons, drugs, medicines that, you know, we buy at the pharmacy, you know, and stand online to get our prescriptions are selective toxins. That's the definition of a drug. It is a selective toxin. And these compounds are selective toxins. The only difference between the drug you get at the pharmacy and the drug or, you know, chemical that dump into the water supply or the food supply is that they don't make any claims that it's going to cure any disease or treat any disease. That's the difference. If they claim that it was going to cure or treat a disease, then it has to go through all the FDA hoops in order to get approval. If they just dump it into the water, they don't have to say a damn thing about it. You, the burden of proof is on you to demonstrate that it's actually a problem. That's what happened with Teflon. Interesting. So something you talk about in the paper is that these obesogens can actually change our desire, our food seeking behavior and the way we actually interact with food on the psychological level. And I wanted to ask you about this because of course, one of your books is Hacking of the American Mind, which is the ultimate tour de force manifesto about our dopamine and serotonin reward systems. And honestly, kind of like required reading for like anyone in my life, because I feel like if we don't understand what's driving us between and how we're hooked on the dopamine roller coaster, like we basically don't understand our behavior and how we're being controlled by external forces. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on just maybe explaining to people how these obesogens can also affect our dopaminergic reward system and impulsivity in our brains and and what we should know about that. Right. So You know, people might, we actually got a little flack from the reviewers about including fructose and artificial sweeteners in this paper on obesogens. They said, how can fructose be an obesogen when it's caloric? And the answer is because it lays down more fat than its calories. Yes, it is caloric but it lays down more fat than its calories. Oh, wait, Artificial- that's really interesting. So that's part, is that part of the definition is that, you know, even though, so you'd expect it to lay down a certain amount of fat but because it's actually doing more, it's stimulating fat growth in some way. So it fits the criteria of obesogen. That's right. That's exactly. so fascinating. Okay. So we had to explain that. And the reason is because it's affecting mitochondria. 
So if it's affecting mitochondria, then you're going to lay down more fat because you're burning less. And maybe that's the reason why body temperature has gone down is because all the sugar in our, in our environment. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you I know the answer to that, but you know, it's not impossible that that could be the reason. Artificial sweeteners, turns out artificial sweeteners uh, make your brain think sugar's coming, so you release more insulin. So even though they don't have any calories themselves, because you release more insulin, you drive more energy into fat. So they're an obesogen, even though they're zero calories as an example, all right? So the fact is that anything that makes your insulin go up is a potential obesogen. And some of those things are specifically added to food on purpose. So yes, that, that is exactly right. Uh, and the, these things are, you know, throughout our, 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 uh, uh, our, our food supply. And again, some of them have been, uh, you know, we didn't know cause these problems, like, for instance, uh, glyphosate and chlorpyrifos is another one. Uh, you know, they're the carboxymethylcellulose, which is an emulsifier uh, that's used in ice cream. Um, you know, so you'd say, well, of course, ice cream's fattening. Well, yes, I'm not saying it's not, but the fact is the carboxymethylcellulose makes it more fattening. Yeah. Yeah. All and right. so what is this doing to our brain in terms of like actually signaling for us to want more food? Like what's well, the, what's the mechanism there? Well, so, so for fructose, it's a direct mechanism for other molecules. It's the insulin, the insulin going up, blocking leptin, which causes it. And then uh, for certain compounds like BPA, it appears to um, uh, have some effects that are uh, consistent with like hyperactivity and attention deficit disorder, which then cause food intake as well. And they, uh, you know, uh, the, the dopaminergic system expresses obese, obesogen targets. And I don't know why, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have the, the, the reason for why that should be, but it, you know, that, that does seem to be the case uh, uh, in animal studies. So, you know, there are, you know, so that might be, you know, some of the reasons, at least, why we see people eating more and, you know, out of the blue. Um, and several medicines that people are on, like SSRIs, can cause you to eat more. Atypical antipsychotics cause insulin resistance, cause you to eat more. So, you know, certain uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, that we take for other reasons might also cause increased weight gain. And they're listed in this uh, paper as well. So what is fascinating, I think, getting back to the epigenetic part of the conversation, is that some of these impacts of obesogens are heritable. And I want to talk about sort of the, you know, interestingly, our, the average levels customer is a woman between the ages of about 30 and 50. So you know, reproductive age. And obviously everyone wants to do best by their, you know, offspring and have the healthiest pregnancy. And you talk about in the paper, these sensitive windows of vulnerability for endocrine disrupting chem chemicals, including obesogens, and that there are periods of time where we are most sensitive to the effects of these things. And some of those are during developmental periods. And you mentioned even in, in utero. And so can you talk a little bit about those um, sensitive windows of vulnerability, what this means for how we should maybe be approaching preconception, conception for t like pregnancy, early childhood development differently um, in our country and individually. Um, and, and maybe also touch on the heritability part and how these things are actually affecting our germline, meaning like our actual, you know, reproductive sex cells. Right. Um, so several of these compounds do affect the germline. Um, uh, they probably, if they affect the germline, it's likely that it's not just an obesity issue. There'll be other issues as well, including reproductive and uh, you know birth defects and things like that as well. Um, Can you define germline these, for people? Because I right. bet most people so, don't know what so that means. Germline means that the uh, uh, the eggs or the sperm are affected, and therefore 
once the zygote is, you know, made, you know, by the um, egg binding to the, uh, you know, uh, the sperm uh, entering the egg, um, that now that those genetics are fixed. And, the entire offspring cells, all their cells. That's right. Yeah. And, we, and, and, you know, scientists have shown that those can persist generation after generation, at least four generations, and in some cases, even longer. So basically, it's not what your mother ate. It's what your great grandmother ate that made a difference and what she was exposed to. And that these things, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving, you know, throughout, you know, uh, the lineage all the way down. Now, those are things you can't fix because you had nothing to do with them. The question is, you know, like what could a pregnant woman avoid that could fix something? Well, one thing she could do is stop smoking. (laughs) Okay. That's like the, you know, the easy one. That's the... That's the, that's the slam dunk is, you know, if you're smoking, you better stop it. Um, passive and passive smoking, secondhand smoke also has been shown to cause an increased BMI and waist circumference in the um, offspring. So there are pro- probably several reasons, including nicotine, including the fact that it changes the um, oxygen tension, you know, the, the, the carbon uh, dioxide and carbon monoxide changes the oxygen tension going to the baby uh, during, you know, while the baby is developing. So that's, that's like a, that's like the, the, the obvious one. Um, another thing that we're, you know, very concerned about are these artificial sweeteners and, you know, they seem to get across and it turns out that adipocytes have receptors for artificial sweeteners. Why? If they're non-caloric, why do adipocytes have receptors for artificial sweeteners? So if the mother's drinking a Diet Coke during pregnancy, is that artificial sweetener getting across the placenta and actually causing fat cell differentiation in the fetus, even though it was a Diet Coke? You know, we know that the fructose is a problem. And we know that actually, if you look at the um, placenta, okay, the placenta of mothers who drink Coke, or not Coke, but I mean, soda, I should, you know, I shouldn't just pick on Coca-Cola, because then everybody will go out and drink Mountain Dew instead. (laughs) All Um, soda. All soda. All soda. Okay, everybody don't don't, you know, it's not just Coke. Um, But uh, uh, there are two parts to the placental lining. One's called the labyrinth and one's called the decidua. And it turns out that if you take in a lot of fructose, the uh, labyrinth gets smaller and the decidua gets bigger. And that ultimately is associated with insulin resistance. Well, it turns out artificial sweeteners affect that as well. Now, why it does that, I don't know, but it does. So don't smoke and try to, you know, limit your sugar consumption and try to stay away from artificial sweeteners as much as possible, I would say, are sort of like the easy things to try to do during pregnancy because, you know, fetal life and early neonatal life are like, you know, the most susceptible times because that's the time when your fat cells are still in dividing mode and you don't want them to keep dividing unless that's necessary and you know that that's what i would say is probably the single uh you know lesson for for pregnant women and so when we're thinking about the sensitive windows of vulnerability for obesogens, is the is the take-home point that you just sort of said that um, because our fat cells divide only up to, until really a certain point, and then they go into more growth mode and less about creating, we, we sort of, like you said in the beginning, we, we have a certain number of fat cells early in life, and we think that's still fairly fixed, and it's more getting overweight is a function of them growing as opposed to dividing more. And because that's happening early in life and obesogens promote laying down more fat cells, 
that that's part of the reason why it's such a problem to be exposed to these early on. Is that accurate or? Okay. That's, that's exactly accurate. So, that's so exactly we're potentially, and, and so what are those sensitive windows? Like, is it pregnancy specifically? Is it a wider period? Pregnancy is the big one. Okay. Uh, without question, early childhood too. I mean, you know, there are other things that go on in early childhood, you know, the growth of, um, of the mouth. Um, one thing that we've learned that has nothing to do with obesogens is that the tongue pressure on the um, uh, hard palate uh, is necessary to grow the airway and to lead to enough oxygen being able to get into the body. Um, and if you don't uh, put that pressure on the, uh, on the hard palate to expand it, you end up with malocclusion, which will ultimately need braces, and you are at increased risk for obstructive sleep apnea, which, as you know, Casey, uh, being a EN, former ENT, is you know sort of the gateway to virtually all of the chronic metabolic diseases that we know of. And how do people, and, and in terms of the tongue pressure, um, what are the turning factors of, of whether a child is going to have that pressure? Well, uh, breastfeeding. So it turns out that it's actually work to uh, latch on to a human nipple and uh, 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 suck hard enough to be able to express milk. Um, uh, artificial nipples, um, baby bottles, uh, and binkies, by the way, you know, uh, pacifiers actually uh, cause less uh, pressure and don't grow that hard palate. Uh, in such a way as to lead to um, uh, appropriate airway development and expansion. So um, best to, you know, ditch the binky and, uh, you know, if, if at all possible, uh, mothers should breastfeed. Mm. Well, I definitely, at some point, it would be so thrilling to do an episode with you on some of the airway stuff, um, you know, given my background and giving some of the amazing stuff you've written on this topic, because I think it also, um, you know, part of the, basically a, a root of health is, uh, is our ability to breathe properly. Um, and so much of how we're approaching the first year of life in terms of nutrition, um, is changing the way our jaw is developing and therefore setting up our airway for a lifetime of problems that end up in the ear, nose and throat doctor's office and operating room. Um, and there's just so much we can do <laughs> to, um, to basically create bigger jaws in babies through lifestyle, and that can actually change our risk of chronic disease long-term. So, on, on April 11th, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Boyd, who is a paleodontist at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, and I are giving a talk to the uh, American Association of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry, AAPMD, uh, called Toddlers in the Crosshairs, talking about exactly oh, this problem. Amazing. Amazing. I, I can't wait to tune in and we'll share that with our, our, our levels network for sure. So summing up here, um, we are surrounded by chemicals and small molecules in our uh, food, water, food additives, food packaging, storage containers for food, cosmetics, personal care products, furniture, electronics, air, pesticides, disinfectants, sunscreens, plastics, household products, antidepressants, and antidiabetic drugs, and cigarette smoke. So just you like, go. you know, a few places that these That's chemicals it. live. Um, and so su <laughs> super, super easy to avoid all these. Um, <laughs> so what, what's the strategy here? Like, yeah. what, what do we what do? What is the strategy? Because right? it sounds like we're screwed. <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> but I know there's then, hope. Yeah, let's put it this way. If we do nothing, then we are screwed. Yes. Okay. The point is that we can do something. All right. First of all, we have to be cognizant of ourselves because no one's going to protect you better than you can protect yourself. That's number one. And if you don't know that this is a problem, then you can't protect yourself. All right. So that's why this paper finally getting it out was so important. And like I said, it's been a long time coming. This particular paper has been a year in the making, but you know, we've known about the problem since 2007. So that's number one, education, uh, you know, about the problem. Okay. Because you can't fix a problem if you don't know what the problem is. Second, 
this paper tells the government, hey, you're on notice. You got to do something. All right. And here's what you need to do. And so we need government to help us with these things because the food industry and the, uh, 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 what do you call it, the agricultural tech industry and the chemical industry, you know, basically gotten a free pass for all these years. And, you know, that's why the EPA was developed back in 1970, you know, was to stop air pollution and water pollution. Well, this is, you know, environmental pollution. And the EPA should be on top of this. But, you know, currently they're not because basically they didn't think obesogens were a problem. But they need to start getting their act together. And, you know, hopefully they will now. And people need to pressure government and, you know, and their congressmen, you know, to get the EPA on board with this. You know, the EPA was basically dismantled. Uh, under the previous administration, you actually had, you know, people who were, you know, oil drillers, you know, running the EPA. So, you know, the, the, uh, we, we've, we've lost a lot of time on this. Um, now, what can individuals do themselves? The answer is buy organic because a lot of these uh, 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 things are, are pesticides. Um, use uh, PFAS uh, free uh, frying pans, which now are the only ones sold. But if you have old ones, you probably need to get rid of them. Uh, uh, Be wary of food preservatives that are added to foods and basically real food. Real food is, you know, sort of the answer here. And um, uh, uh, you know, you, have, you know, BPA is now known, you know, it's in all these plastic bottles. It's in, you know, baby bottles, it's in nipples, et cetera. These are, uh, uh, hard, hard truths and they're not going to go away easily. Uh, but we, we have to, we have to start, uh, working at mitigating some of these, uh, over time. And, uh, uh it's not going to happen fast, but you know, you got to start somewhere. Yep. Okay, so I'm hearing buy organic. Um, previously in the episode, we've talked about obviously don't smoke, avoid artificial sweeteners. Um, so this is sucralose, aspartame. Not necessarily. We're not talking about um, natural, non-nutritive sweeteners here, like stevia, monk fruit, or allulose. Is that right? Well, um, they can still raise insulin, right? So they're not they're not completely uh, um, free pass. You know, uh, <laughs> Uh, innocent, but you know there are some that are worse than others, and uh, uh, you know sucralose is famous for causing uh, leaky gut and glucose intolerance. That's a particularly bad guy in the story. In the paper itself, on in Figure Four, we list all of the uh, the bad guys. Mm. So you know, and there are quite a few of them. You know, there's yeah. the spartame, azosulfame K, saccharin, sucralose, stevia is on there, neotame, alatame, monk fruit. You know, miraculin. Oh. You know, they're all they're all there. So um, it's so not uh, it's not just one. That's a good clarification. I actually didn't see that that stevia and monk fruit were on there, and that's helpful. And I'm assuming that's because in in some research, it's been shown that they raise insulin, like yeah, what you talked they about. They raise insulin. Okay, if they so- raise insulin. They're going to drive the insulin receptor, and the insulin receptor is going to lay down fat. And generally, things that are sweet may impact our cephalic insulin response, make our brains think something sweet's coming and, and, and release insulin. Okay. So we've got, so artificial sweeteners, um, you talked about cigarettes, air pollution, um, organic food. What about personal care products and home care products? Yeah. Uh, it's a parabens, uh, are in, you know, lipstick and yeah, that's a big one. So yes, these are all concerns. Um, let me tell you about a patient that I took care of years ago. Uh, it was a five-year-old girl who started developing breasts. And so I worked her up for precocious puberty, and it turned out that her hypothalamus was fine and her, uh, her ovaries weren't even working. So where was she getting the breasts from? And so I did an entire, you know, I thought maybe she's consuming mom's birth control pills. No, that that wasn't it. And we went through everything. And finally, I asked the mother, 
what do you use in the bath water? Mm. And it turned out she bathed the kid in Victoria's Secret bath gel. And I asked her to bring it in. And it said right on it, for adult use only. And the reason is because it contained um, genistein, which is a plant estrogen, okay, phytoestrogens. And so it caused breast development. Well, guess what? It also causes weight gain. Interesting. And I'm assuming the phytoestrogen concept is really interesting because people bring this up a lot with soy. Um, I'm assuming that this is the differential effect in a child is that because they're not making much interest estrogen pre-puberty that any estrogen in the body is going to have a clinical sort of clinical impact. Exactly. Fascinating. In terms of personal care products, I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a topic that's, that's near and dear to me because I love, I love cosmetics. I love all of it, you know, and over, you know, I'm kind of, I love this stuff. And I think that my journey over the years has been, you know, very much moving from standard products with fragrances, bath and body works, like all these things, you know, to just like as simple as humanly possible, the minimal ingredients, like, you know, organic cast style soap for almost every soap that I use, you know, using a hundred percent jojoba oil for moisturizer, things that just don't have the 50 chemicals. Um, one of the websites that has been really useful in my sort of figuring out what to use is the environmental working groups website, which has like a list of thousands and thousands of home care and personal care products and kind of ranks them based on toxicity. Is that, what yes. are your feelings on EWG? I, I, we, I use EWG also. Um, and Ken Cook, the head of EWG is a good friend. And uh, yes, that's a, that's a great place to go to get, uh, you know, both uh, sugar information uh, like in breakfast cereals and also um, uh, uh, environmental pollution information on various things. So yes, I, I, I strongly recommend them. Yeah. And then what are your thoughts on air and water filtration? Um, well, helpful, air, not helpful. Everyone should have an air filter in their house because <laughs> um, there's junk in the air anyway, and it'll help with your allergies. Um, you know, obviously, you know, hey, don't live too close to a freeway. What can I say? <laughs> Particulate matter causes inflammation and inflammation causes insulin resistance and insulin resistance causes weight gain. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, a problem. Uh, how, how to fix that problem? You know, I, I don't know how to fix that problem yet. So any other last pearls for people listening to this episode of, you know, how they can sort of um, think about avoiding these things in their life? Any other things that you do in your life or that the research shows that are really effective in terms of reducing the body, you know, the body burden of this stuff? And maybe also just, I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, we're, we're talking mostly about avoidance of these things and elimination right. of these things, but is there right. anything there's we no, can do? There's to no medicine our- for this. Yeah. There is no medicine for this, you know, that people need to understand, you know, do not go to your naturopath and have him chelate you. It's not going to work. All right. That's not the way to answer this problem. The, the, the best way to uh, uh, handle this problem, unfortunately, is avoidance. Um, and that makes it hard. And I'm not going to tell you it's not because you can't see it. How do you avoid something you can't see? So you ha- th- that's where the education comes in. And is there anything we can do to set our bodies up to be more resilient to this type of thing um, and also to potentially get these chemicals out of our body? Well, that, as I said, the, the, the best way to get these chemicals out of the body is hydration, pee them out. And, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's about what we've got at this point. Maybe, you know, we'll, we'll start working on how to... F- you know, find ways of uh, mitigating this problem, uh, you know, at a biochemical level, but I don't know what it is. I think that's going to be fascinating follow-up to this type of work. I mean, this lays the groundwork for, I feel like a lot of future directions. Um, And um, one of those that would be so interesting to think about is like, how, how are these, you know, how is each one detoxified by the body? And is it the liver? Is it in the stool? Like what is, you know, 
uh, what are the different pathways involved and how can we sort of optimize those things? So that'll be interesting to follow this field as, as it emerges. Um, and, uh, I think there there was one last thing I wanted to ask you about, which is that in the paper, there there was a mention of like how we might be able to in the future personally monitor these things in our bodies to kind of see what's going on with our toxic burden. Like, what do you think the likelihood of that happening is in the near future? Well, you know, look, we're already talking about other small molecule monitoring for levels. You know, we're talking about uh, various uh, uh, channels that could be on a wearable. Now, there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to do that, uh, you know, for uh, compounds that uh, exist in nature. Um, it would require some engineering to be sure. But, you know, if you're wearing a wearable, you know, adding a couple of channels to look for other stuff is not so uh, uh, crazy or impossible. Um, you know, maybe that'll be the way to do it. That's definitely a world that I think would be interesting because because they are invisible and a lot of the effects are lagging, um, given that they are, some of them are epigenetic and some of them take years to develop, which I thought was a really interesting concept that was brought up in the, the paper as well, is that some of these effects aren't immediate. You're not going to yes, see the next absolutely. day that this obesogen right. is affecting you. And so that's where sometimes having that more closed loop biofeedback can be so helpful. Just and like also, tobacco smoke, yes. you know, you don't know that it's a problem until it's a problem. Well, thank you so much, Rob, for chatting about all of this. And um, it's such a fascinating topic. This paper is, I think, going to do a lot to just totally change the world as all your work does. And um, we really look forward to spreading the message and helping get this information out there. So thank you so much. I just want to say that, you know, this is the work of 44 separate scientists um, uh, and, the, and they all deserve an enormous amount of credit. And I particularly want to thank Jerry Heindel, who, you know, basically, you know, was the taskmaster to keep, you know, this 44, you know, herd of cats, uh, you know, herded, uh, and got this done. And, um, he deserves a lot of credit and, uh, you know, Jerry, if you're listening, uh, you know, it, 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 this hats off to you. 